Hello, and thank you again for returning. I'm glad I didn't scare you off. I have uh, Francis H. Powell, our featured author, and also host for the blog hop going up uh, for this holiday season. And I'm currently on Francis's website and looking through an article and something from his website that I decided to pull and read. Um, anyone who's followed me knows that I am a huge, passionate supporter I gotta say this right or else it's just gonna not come out right. Um, I love studying war and the history of. I almost said I was a supporter of war and that just is not, no. <laughs> um, I've taken time out to uh, study and view every movie, every uh, everything available as far as the wars from uh, World War One on up to present day. So I'm very hands-on as far as capturing the reality of it and following it. It's, to me, it's a very fascinating part of our culture. Yes, it's part of our culture. And it also does a lot to capture our humanity. Um, despite it bringing out some of the worst parts of humans, it also brings out some of the best parts of us. Uh, that being said, the horrors of war is something that it looks like Francis Powell put together. and. I haven't read this yet and I'm just, again, I see it and I'm like, oh, what does he have to say about this? So I'm going to go ahead and read this to you from his blog. Uh, this is uh, can be found at Francis Powell Writer, I'm sorry, Francis H. Powell Writer dot WordPress dot com. And the link will be available underneath this video, so if you want to go and browse to see what else he's written, you're more than welcome to take a look, of course. And this is The Horrors of War. We can only imagine what it was like to be part of a war. I am lucky to have spent most of my life untouched by war. It is true that when I was off in my later teens, there were the Falk Falklands War. My brother-in-law was sent off as part of the task force. It was very surreal. Britain fighting Argentina over some islands most people in Britain have never heard of. Thankfully, my brother-in-law came back despite sustaining an injury to his eyes. He was no longer able to be a helicopter pilot due to his impaired eyesight, but at least he came back alive and was able to be a parent to his three young children. My father was a prisoner of war for almost the entire duration of the Second World War. How much he was scarred from, the, from this experience, it is hard to calculate. He was reticent, reticent, reticent to speak about this. It was a part of his life he wanted to set apart, conceal. The psychological collateral of war is enormous. The thing soldiers and civilians drawn into a conflict see undou undoubtedly leave their mark and are imprinted on the minds of those who witness unimaginable horror before their eyes. I was brought up on a diet of war films that were essentially propaganda. Mm -hmm. The hero always survived, or if not, died heroically, but was killed in a wholesome way, a clean shot in the chest. There were war films without the gruesome reality of war, showing soldiers going out about their duty as they should. I'm, I'm getting angry, Angela. You need to calm down from this. Um, yeah, he's. I, I, I can most definitely relate to this topic. Um, I am a huge MASH fan. And MASH was one of the very first films to actually start depicting more properly. And when I wrote Dollar and Shadow, I made a point of showing war as it really is. And uh, yeah, this, this one is touching my, my sensitive spots. They were war films without the gruesome reality of war, showing soldiers going out about their duty as they should. There must have been a few films that were realistic. It was a time when a boy wanted a toy gun, pretended to be a soldier without being aware of the true impact of war on he, on he, on those who live, of those who involved. When Searching for Private Ryan came along, war films took a new direction. It is the start of the film for me that is the most meaningful. The rest of the film does not have its intensity. The film has been criticized for all its mistakes, inaccuracies, and contradictions, but to one side, all of the first and half an hour of the film is a great pertinence seeing the limbs of friends and comrades being blown off, bullets whizzing past you, the noise, men screaming in agony, men drowning, all this unimaginable carnage going all on all around you is as close as we can get to trying to understand what it was like, to a certain extent at least. Those who had been through the experience, World War II veterans, were of the opinion that the film was the most realistic depiction of combat they had ever seen. Some found it too realistic. Veterans of D-Day and Vietnam left theaters rather than finish watching the opening scene depicting the Normandy invasion. The film even meant that visits to post 
The film even meant that visits to post-traumatic stress disorder counselors rose in numbers after the film's release, and many counselors advised more psychologically vulnerable veterans to avoid watching it. Funnily enough, the last in the series, A Black Ladder, in which Rowan Atkinson act and act <laughs> Rowan Acton Atkinson stars as a captain in the horrific First World War, underlies the stupidity of war. Idiotic aristocratic generals sending young men in their prime to certain deaths as if it were sure they would be massacred by, mach massacred by machine gun fire. The sentiment in Black Letter influenced a passage in one of my stories called Blind Shot. It is a story about a man who was blinded during a war. It is a story about paranoia. I kind of don't want to read further because I really want to watch this movie. Without the man's use of his eyes, his imagination begins to get hold. The man who is married has an affair while recovering in hospital with one of the nurses. The nurse reads him letters, supposedly sent by his wife, telling him she is going to have a baby but the father is another man. The man is not only traumatized by the war but is also afraid of going back to his wife. Here is an, an excerpt in which an aristocratic general talks to the main character. It was supposed to be the war to end all wars, but it proved to be just another in a long list of bloody transactions by power, hungry politicians, money, grubbing industrialists, and incompetent generals, which led to pointless casualties. He barely arrived in the trenches before being ordered by his commanding officer, a man more versed in killing stags on a Scottish heath than military tactics, to send his company of minimally trained adolescents to their deaths. He fared luckier than most, or so he was told. The medics found him face down in the mud, barely breathing, and dragged him back to friendly lines. They patched up his flesh wounds and applied the usual psychological salve to his fractured mind. The only thing they couldn't fix was his eyes. The gas had left him blind. His unit, due to be issued gas masks, had been rushed to the front without them. In a moment of desperation, the general, drawing first from a cigar wedged between his fat fingers and then from a flask of brandy, had shared with his captain a few words of encouragement before issuing a preposterous order. Well, they won't need gas masks. The young lads are fit and healthy. If they have their wits about them, they should be able to dodge bullets or whatever is thrown in their direction, adding in a more menacing tone. And if they don't, and if they don't follow their orders and do their duty, you'll all be court-martialed and shot. Better to die an unsung hero than a live a coward, he chortled, dismissing the captain. This reminds me so much of uh, War Horse. Um, I finished up the last of my uh, movie, horror, war movie watching. It was actually my uh, New Year's resolution for 2015 was to finally watch Platoon. And following Platoon, I also watched Full Metal Jacket for the first time. Wow. And then I watched uh, Fury. Again, wow. <laughs> um, wow, just, just wow. Phenomenal films. Um, and I watched War Horse. War Horse, oh my god. Of all the movies to depict the humanity and inhumanity of war, watch War Horse. Phenomenal movie. And there is this moment, it was the only movie I've ever watched in all the war movies I've seen, where this line is delivered. Go, fight, run, charge them. And if you see your brother and run back, you shoot him. And I just, they were ordered to shoot each other if they turned back. That just, the only movie to ever, oh, wow. It's amazing. Back to the article. As Edwin Starr said, war. Huh. Yeah. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. <sighs> oh, war I despise because it means destruction of innocent lives. War means tears to the thousands of mothers' eyes when their sons go off to fight and lose their lives. Okay, yeah, that one really... Thank you, Francis. That was a very, as I said, that one kind of hit home. There is a history I have to share because it's just, wow. Again, wow. I um, was in a doctor's office in a waiting room, and these two men came in and sat down. They were very 
Wow, they were probably the age of my grandfather, if not a little older. One of them had served in Vietnam, the other had served in World War II, and they started swapping stories. They started comparing war experiences and experiences when they came home. The man from World War II came home and received a warrior's welcome. He was greeted. There were banners, parades, medals, massive amounts of honor, people supporting, crying, and people out to meet him. Um, but with Vietnam, the man explained, the man from Vietnam explained that when he got back, it, it was just amazing what they brought with them. They had, when you go to war, they explain to each other, you get this feeling like you are just trying to live. You are literally just trying to survive. It stops being the enemy, a war. It's no longer a war. When you enter that, it's live, it's kill or be killed. It's absolute survival. And the man from Vietnam explained how he spent all this time trying to stay alive, trying to, to make it, just so he could get back home again. It was absolute pure survival. And the man from World War II concurred. He had the same experience. And both men explained that they also had a similar experience where after all that they did, after all the time that they spent just trying to survive, it, they were amazed at what it took at the end. The man from Vietnam survived. He was over at the war for about, a, I think he said a year, year and a half. He got home, stepped off the plane with his friend. They had just been boasting how they made it back and somebody from the audience, an American, shot him in the forehead and killed him right there. It wasn't the enemy that killed him, it was one of our own. It wasn't on enemy territory, it was when he stepped off the plane here in the States. The man from World War II then shared his experience that there was one soldier he fought with, it was his best friend, and he watched this man, he was an amazing warrior. He fought his way through everything. He, he was the man who, walked, who ran in, pulled people out, had an arm missing and still made it. He was a tough SOB. What finally did him in was a bee sting a year after he had arrived back at the States. This man, he'd seen him take down such Goliath warriors, such, such arms. He, he, was, he was a phenomenal soldier. And it was a simple bee, a bee sting that took him down. And hearing these two men just compare their experiences, it was it was like stepping into whenever I see anything on TV, Hollywood even, there's a lot of questions going on in my mind going, how much am I really seeing? How much is really being shown and how much is being kept from me? And I can't help but wonder the propaganda that's been influenced and at the same time I'm looking at when you hear the men like that talk there is no propaganda it's just pure this is the way it was it, it really is an amazing experience I have so much more to say on this and I'm not going to because I can talk for hours on this topic so I'm gonna wrap it up um, I will say again um, I have two more book readings coming tomorrow. I will be doing chapter... La, 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 la. I'm checking my bookmark here. Chapter four. Please. Yes, chapter four and chapter five will be posted tomorrow. As well as our next host, or I'm sorry, our next guest, which is Latoya Wilson. And there will be a reading, an excerpt from her site. So again, thank you very much and subscribe to the YouTube account if you would like to hear more um, readings, get newsletters, and whatnot. And also go ahead and subscribe to the website. Thank you very much for joining us today.